So really what we're talking about is what's focused in 2018, as I just mentioned. Here are, is what the International Cotton Society says. This is what we say about LUTs. Uh, storage symptoms, voiding symptoms, post-micturition symptoms. But there's a practical clinical diagnosis, or clinical symptoms, should I say. We have urgency, we have frequency, we have incontinence, we have nocturia and stream. But as I mentioned just now, we have failed on this because we focus on the vehicles that hold the urine as opposed to urine production. And so I want you to think about this. When we think about the bladder, we think about it as a storage vehicle. It stores three to, three to 500 mLs, and it should hold it comfortably and empty it comfortably. We think of the outlet, the prostate, the urethra, the bladder neck. That is to allow the exit of urine when it's appropriate and to hold urine when it's appropriate. We also think about fluid, or we should be thinking about fluid production, because I could have a normally functioning prostate and a normally functioning bladder, but if I am pushing fluid through at a mass production rate, right, then that question is, is that normal or abnormal? And I want you to think about this picture. I think we all remember this. This is Lucy from years ago in the candy store. We have the production, the conveyor belt of, of candy going down, and Lucy and her partner are comfortably able to take the candy, put it in the boxes. All right, that's normal. Normal production of urine, normal uh, storage capacity. Well, abnormal function is when the bladder doesn't do what it's supposed to do. It doesn't hold three to 500 mLs. The outlet is blocking the exit. All right, that's your BPH patient. Or it allows leakage. So there are two things that could be happening and the kidney is producing too much urine. That is abnormal function. So again, if we go back to Lucy, what we see is that production here that's massive, and they're not able to handle it. So the whole system goes awry. So it's not just the vehicles that hold the urine, but there's also that component of the urine itself. So that abnormal function, it's OAB or incontinence if you can't hold that normal amount. If the outlet is blocking the exit, it's BPH or stricture or incontinence if it allows leakage. And if the kidney is producing too much fluid, it's polyuria or nocturnal, uh, or nocturia or nocturnal polyuria. Now, this is a, a paper that was published in 2017 by Elke. This actually, the title on this was the, the workup, the evaluation of um, nocturia. But I, I took this, I, I, uh, I looked at this, and I said, you know, it's not only nocturia, but if you add incontinence, which I just added this on right here, this gives us the view of lower urinary tract symptoms. This gives us a view of everything that's going on. So if we compartmentalize and think about the patient coming in, we can fix them. I mean, think about Lucy as you're looking at this. You know, if we have the leakage, it's stress or urgency. All right, now... If it's de we have decreased bladder capacity, do we have increased fluid intake, or is there a failure of our ability to produce the correct amount? And that is an increased diuresis. Is something going on? When we look at the reasons for that, if you have a decreased bladder capacity, there's anatomic versus functional. Anatomics, that fibrotic bladder, the scarred bladder, the radiation bladder, whatever it is, it is not able to hold what it's supposed to, as opposed to our functional capacity decrease. That's your OAB patient with the, the bladder that spasms at low amounts. That's your BPH patient that has a high residual and so it doesn't take much to be able to get them to the capacity that they need to void. That is interstitial cystitis where you void at smaller amounts because of the irritation or it's even secondary causes like a stone, like cancer, maybe a foreign body. You have the Increased fluid intake that's 24 hours, too much fluid. These are your iatrogenic, your psychogenic, your dipsogenic polyuria. You have an evening and night problem for, uh, maybe these are the, your, your iatrogenic issues. Maybe this is your alcoholic. Maybe this is the idea that you got watching Dr. Oz that drinking a lot of fluid at night is a very good idea. So you have your gallon of water at bed. And my wife does that. My, every night before my wife goes to sleep, there's a huge glass of water and she drinks the water through the night. And she actually asked me one night, I was working on a paper on this, and she looks at me and she goes, I need, that's what I have, I need a medication for this. I said, no, you need to get rid of the water next to your bed, All right? She did not think that was funny, but I did prove my point. Drink? Well, actually, it's a funny story, it's funny that you say that, because I can't really show you the picture right now, but I will later. 
So I was working on a piece a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I went to bed. It was about 12 o'clock. She was already asleep, and she had her gallon jug of water next to her bed. And uh, I walk up, and there's my dog on her nightstand with his entire head in a glass of water. <laughs> so, of course, because I'm a good supportive husband, I took a photo of it. I didn't tell her till the next morning when she finished the water. <laughs> I'm like, guess who you just shared saliva with? Congratulations. She was not amused. I was tremendously amused. It was very funny. So what about that diuresis? You know, now we, we talk about the fluid intake. What about when we're just diuresing fluid? When does that happen? Well, there's that all the time, the global, that's your diabetes, your re kidney problems, your electrolyte problems, but that could be your nighttime issues. We have, we from an evolutionary standpoint, we have arginine vasopressin that actually works on the kidney that extracts free water and it extracts free water so that we don't produce all this urine at night so we can sleep because sleep is good survivability is up if we sleep well if that's not functioning we're producing a lot of urine so that can do nighttime diuresis we also get it from cardiac issues from uh, atrial natriuretic peptide we see that with, uh, I see that frequently with patients who come in with congestive failure whose legs swell during the day and they lift them up and that water rushes to the heart and they're peeing all night because that increased diuresis happens. It's a, a normal response to a disease. So the question that we should ask as we think about that last slide from Elkie is, are these independent things? Maybe we need to focus on this a little differently because we, we tend to put each patient into a bracket. You have OAB. You have BPH. You have nocturia. Maybe we need to understand that, yes, they can be in, independent, but they can coexist as well. And the question we need to ask is what should we actually be focusing on? And, and in a clinic, it's very simple. We, we focus on we, our symptoms help us focus on treatment choice. Is it a flow issue, a storage issue? We need to think, is it a volume issue? When is it happening? Is it a daytime, nighttime issue? Or is it a wedding issue? Because all of these things will help us decide what to do. So when we see the patient, and this is what I wanted as my overview for Lutz. When we look at this patient, Lutz is just not one thing. And just because you're a male, it doesn't mean you have BPH. And just because you're a female, it doesn't mean you have OAB. And if it's refractory, we have to ask ourselves why. When is the disease refractory? Is it refractory because we picked the wrong treatment? Is it refractory because the treatment we chose was incomplete? Or because we're treating the wrong disease? So when we look at the treatment of LUTs and we can say all of these, a lot of these meds uh, fail and patients don't take them forever, blah, blah, blah. The bottom line is instead of, you know, you've heard the adage, if you keep, if, if, if you keep doing the same thing, why do you expect a different outcome? If we keep thinking it's OAB and keep treating OAB, but they're not responding, maybe it's not OAB. The same for BPH, the same for, for, for nocturia. So I think what I've learned in 2018 is we need to start looking outside of the box. We need to redefine how we talk about refractory disease and refractory LUTs in general. So I want to shift gears, and, and I'm going to talk about two different things that are new for 2018. One is what can we do in refractory OAB if, in fact, they have it, and the next section we'll be talking about Nocturia. So if we define overactive bladder, go back to the ICS definition, ur urinary urgency, frequency, nocturia, urgency, uh, with or without urinary uh, urgency incontinence in the absence of pathology. The reality is a lot of people have it. This slide just shows it. A lot, 30 million people have it. We understand that more women than men, but as they're younger. As men age, they get the same amount of issues that women do. If we look at the AUA and the SUFU guidelines, I think it helps us understand how to treat this. And I, I always like to show this, a first line is behavioral modification. You know, look at, look at my wife. I'm having an issue. I drink a lot of water. Stop drinking the water. Let's see what happens. So we should never ignore the opportunity for behavior. If we go to second line, now we talk about our pharmacologic agents. We've had monotherapy for the beta-3s and the antimuscarinics, and we're gonna, that's what we're going to talk about, a new option in this second line. We want to be careful to dose modify or change or elevate because that is what we do. That's what we do because it does help the patient. The third line is really more in the realm for you guys as urologists. That's the Botox, the PTNS, 
and the SNS, and then the additional treatments, which is a last ditch, is the indwelling catheter of the bladder augmentation. A, a sobering reality, disappointing reality, however you want to look at it, is when we treat OAB, and this is the, in re, the real world, as, I, probably especially in primary care, when we treat OAB, the reality is in six months, most people are off the meds. If you look at, there's a three-year chart that I didn't put up here, which shows that 8% of patients are still on medications after three years. All right, so it doesn't, it's, it's not working in everybody. And the question then we have to ask is why is it not working? And I, I gave a lecture in Glasgow at the ICS a couple years ago where we specifically focused on why is it not working? Is it not working because we are treating the wrong disease or is it not working because the meds don't work, they have reactions, they can't afford it, or they've, they stopped it just because it worked and they don't have a problem anymore, or they don't perceive it as a problem. And I think the reality is a lot of people just learn to suffer through it. And this study here from Chancellor shows about just under 90% of patients are actually asking for something else. They're not getting a complete effect. They may be getting a little better, but they're not getting enough better that there are enough improvement that they're happy about it. So in 2018, we now have approval for a combination of medications for the use of OAB. So this is what's new out there in refractory uh, OAB. You've got a beta-3, in this case, Meribigron. Uh, in, with addition of a low-dose sulfenosine and antimuscarinic for the treatment of overactive bladder. So why is that? And we've known this for years, and although the indication just came out, I think a lot of us have used this for years. The idea is this. When, you're, when you have overactive bladder and you look at the pure definition, the bladder contracts at small amounts. If the bladder contracts at small amounts, what are we going to do about that? Well, we want to increase the amount. We want to increase the amount the bladder can hold. So you can stimulate the anti-muscarinic, or you can block the muscarinic receptor, which actually blocks contraction, so that can hold more. Or you can activate the beta-3. The beta-3 allows relaxation. That holds more. So obviously, two different receptors, two different MOAs, different side effect profiles. Can you get a synergistic effect? And that is now what's available. So I'm going to show two studies here on how this works. The first study is Synergy 1. This was a forced study. So what they did, a placebo run-in randomization, they basically put you into a combination versus placebo versus monotherapy using Meribegron at a 25 or 50 milligram dose and keeping solofenacin at a 5. Typical for a LUT study, it was a 12-week study, and then you had a run-out. I want to show you the baseline characteristics because I do think it's important to look at this. Who is the patient that we're studying when we do LUTs? All right, and it's important to remember this for the next uh, uh, patient characteristics I'm going to show you on the next study. Mainly female, you see the age just under about 60, you see mixed, uh, in, mixed stress, duration of symptoms, pr uh, long time, you see prior OAB medications, quite a bit of them. 50% of these patients have tried something. So the question is, it's not whatever they're taking is not working or has not worked or they just stopped it altogether. A lot of urge incontinence and micturitions, they're going 10 to 11 times a day. But you figure even if you sleep poorly, you're probably getting up twice a night to pee, right? So that means, you know, eight to 10 times during the day you're voiding. Well, if you're awake 16 hours or 17 hours, that's a lot. You're, you're voiding a lot during the day. And the volumes are typical. And anytime you look at a LUT study, look at the volume. Because o by definition, OAB is contracting at small volumes, so you better see small volumes as you look at your LUT. So remember that as I show you the next baseline study in a few minutes. When you look at the data, and there's going to be a lot of graphs here, what you're seeing is, is the number of incontinent episodes per 24 hours versus monotherapy worked. All right? It was significant when you looked at combination versus uh, uh, mirror big round 25. It was better, but it was not significant when you looked at the five, uh, combination versus a 5 milligram of sulfenosine. So here you have the combination therapy. Here you have the two monotherapies, and here you have placebo. So you're definitely getting an effect. When you look at the uh, higher dose, the uh, sulfenosine 5 and the Mirabegron 50, you don't have significance versus the 50, but you do versus the sulfenosine 5 in monotherapy. Again, a definite benefit. It's trending both ways. Probably if it ran out longer, it would show significance. But you are seeing improvement enough that it might be worth trying that in that refractory patient. Okay. What about combination therapy for the number of micturitions per 24 hours? Remember, these patients are going 10 to 11 times a night. So what you see here is 
uh, is a significance for both doses versus, I'm sorry, the, the low dose of the mono, uh, combination therapy versus the lower dose of the monotherapy. Here is the Sully 5 and the Mirror Big Run 25 versus the uh, Sully 5 versus the Mirror Big Run 25 versus placebo. So you're significant there for the reduction in micturitions. Here you see for the higher dose, the, this is a Cellophenicin 5 and the uh, Mirror Big Run 50. Uh, better than the Sully 5 alone or the Mirror Big Run 50 alone. So again, combination is helping. Now, this study here is my favorite study. This is a beside study because this is a real world study. What this shows is what I do in practice. In a primary care setting, and this may be different from what y'all are seeing in a urologic setting, I am not going to have a patient come in and say, I'm going to put you on combo right away. It's not going to happen. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start with one medication at a low dose, and then I'm going to add on if I need to. That's practical. In primary care, we like the idea of go slow, start low. All right, I'm sure you guys have heard that before. So in this study, you have your typical washout phase. You start with a low dose of cellophenicin 5. If you achieved 100% satisfaction, doc, I'm happy, I'm done, you're out of the study. So what they're looking at here is only patients who said, I could be better. And they say, I could be better, so what are we going to do? We're going to give them something else. We're going to either uh, keep them on the sulfenacin 5, we're going to increase the sulfenacin to 10, or we're going to add Mirabigron. We're going to do 25 milligrams for four weeks, and then we're going to go eight weeks of the 50. The only difference I would have done for myself is I, if patients were satisfied at the low, lower combination, I would have extracted them. They did what's called a forced titration. But if you look at the data, look at the baseline, there's a couple interesting things here. You, you see this, they're, they're ma more female than male. You see the age about the same. Everything is about the same except for here. See that when we talked about the micturitions before, it was 10 to 11. Now it's 9. So these are people that are, this is real world. These are people saying, you know, yes, I'm voiding twice, two times less a night, but I'm not happy. I'm not happy because it still is not where I want to be. So these are now what I would consider your refractory patient. So if you look at the uh, combination therapy and the reduction of the number of incontinent episodes per 24 hours versus monotherapy, you have that improvement. So now your baseline goes down, you get even more benefit. You're getting even more benefit. There are two things to learn from this. One, combination is better than monotherapy. And two, for the patients that stay on the cellophenicin 5, over time they seem to be getting better. So combination is definitely better, but it also teaches us to tell the patients to hold the line and keep working on things. So it's a very good option for the refractory case. Combination therapy reduces the number of micturitions in 24 hours versus monotherapy alone. Again, it seems to work. You get a markedly better effect with combination therapy for that refractory patient. So you've taken that patient who had some effect, decreasing the number of voids by about two, but telling you, I'm not quite happy yet. It's not working for me. That patient, if you didn't offer them something, likely would have stopped the medication. Now that you're giving them something in addition, maybe they've gotten to their treatment goals. And maybe as a result, we're going to see more, um, more duration for them. They're going to stay on the drug longer and actually hopefully be better longer. This shows the uh, efficacy in combination therapy for the percentage of patients reaching incontinence. And I think this is kind of interesting because it, when a patient comes into my office, if they're having wedding accidents, they're unhappy. If they're having fewer wedding accidents, they're less unhappy, so they're a little happier. If they're having no wedding accidents, they're, they're happy. And they're going to tell me, you know, this is working. I don't have to use those Depends anymore. What this shows, this is now Sully 5 and 10 versus Combo, is when you use combination, you're getting that goal, getting more closer to that goal. You're getting more patients with zero incontinence and more patients who decrease the number of times they're incontinence. And that, what we've learned over time is wet is what drives people crazy. Wet is what brings them into the office. So if I can stop them from having the accident, they're going to be much more happier, uh, much more happy with those results. For fair balance, we got to look at what kind of side effects we might see when we're using combination therapy because we don't want to. We want a synergistic efficacy but we don't want to make it worse for the patient in terms of their adverse events. The worst thing we see with the antimuscarinics has been the dry mouth. That's what, if you, if you look across the board for why people want to stop it, dry mouth is the top. 
and we'll tell them, hang in there over time, it should get better, which it does. However, when you use com the goal with combination is to go with, can we use lower doses for a better effect and less side effects? And this doesn't show side effects of sulafenacin 10, but we know with sulafenacin 10, it is a markedly higher dry mouth rate than it is with sulafenacin 5. So what happens with dry mouth here? You have placebo 2.2 with the mirabigron. You see a little bit of dry mouth, which is interesting because it doesn't have a mechanism for that. You definitely see it with the sulafenacin 5, and it does go up a little bit when you're using combination therapy. So it's not perfect. It seems to be okay, but it's something to warn the patient. You're still going to have that, but we're just going to try to decrease it. And although it doesn't show it on the slide because it wasn't reported in the study, my guess is if you looked at sulafenacin 10, uh, plus mirror big around 25 or 50, you would see a markedly higher dry mouth. And you had, did see that in some of the earlier studies that I'm not going to show here. The other things you see for uh, side effects, urinary tract infections, constipation, tachycardia, things that you need to warn the patient about. So I think in summary of this section, what we want to say is we have good opportunities in 2018 to better help our patient and combination therapy is something we want to think about. Now, I'd like to shift gears, and is it okay if we take questions at the end, or do you want to interrupt, because I want to kind of go section by section. Good. So let's talk about Nocturia now. And Nocturia has kind of come to the forefront because we have treatments for it. We have safe treatments for it. So the lesson learned, or if I were to teach you the conclusion for this section, is this, is that sleep is good, nocturia interferes sleep, and we now have safe and efficacious ways in 2018 of treating it which are, treatment, are options that we didn't have before. So if we look back to the ICS definition of nocturia as defined as waking at night to urinate with each voiding episode preceded and followed by sleep, cleaning, clinically meaningful if it's greater than or equal to two. We define nocturnal polyuria as production of, or 20% of your urine production is at night. If you're younger, it's 33% if you're older. I will tell you, I do not like this definition at all. It's, it's okay but I don't like it. And the reason I don't like it is, no, is, is nocturia is actually when we produce urine at night that's greater than functional bladder capacity. Go back to Lucy. We're creating more urine at night that overcomes our ability to hold the urine. As a result, we have to get up to void. That is nocturia. And that's how I discuss it with my patients. Because you're, not everyone's bladder is the same. You might have OAB, you might have BPH, you might have a billion other reasons for it. But if your creation of fluid is greater at night than your functional bladder capacity could hold, you have nocturia. And whether you're bothered by it is a different story, and that's what I need to ask you. You're having this, you get up, are you bothered? But if you understand what I just mentioned about the nighttime production of urine, then you're going to understand that we either decrease the nighttime creation of urine, or we increase the ability to hold the urine. It's as simple as that. So when we look at the definition of nocturnal polyuria, it's 20% and younger, or 33% and older, we can tangle ourselves up with complexities and make patients do bladder diaries, but we're really looking at, we should be looking at it in a much more simple way. Now, what's interesting is is when we talk about nocturia, and I remember I, I was at a meeting about a year or two ago, and I was the only primary care doc in the room. And we were talking about nocturia. And I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about this, and I'm looking around the room, and of course urologists think about nocturia. Because for us, for years, nocturia has been a symptom of OAB or BPH. You have a small bladder, contracts a lot, you void more often. You have BPH, you can't, you can't void very well, your stream is low, you have a high post-void residual, you void at night, that's bothersome. But, but those are only symptoms. And, and I showed a slide in, uh, in, in Denver, or uh, where we were in Colorado Springs this summer. And I, I, tongue in cheek, I put up a slide that said, who owns urine? Nobody owns urine. It's part of every, We all deal with it. You guys deal with the structure that urine goes through. I actually deal with medications that affect our volumes, our intervascular volumes, and what goes through the kidney. So we all own urine. Nobody really owns it. But we've thought about nocturia being just urologic because of the OAB and the BPH. And the reality, it's not. We've got to start thinking out of the box here. We have to understand that nocturia, and I put a question mark, is it a normal part of aging? Because 
you'll see in the urologic literature and the nephrologic literature this idea that it, you know, it's not a normal part of aging. Well, in fact, it is a normal part of aging. As we get older, our arginine vasopressin doesn't work as well. It doesn't work as well. It's defective. Our V2 receptors are defective, which means the mechanism to extract free water out of the kidney at night doesn't work as well. So we void more at night. So it is a normal part of aging, but it's not a normal part of aging that we have to live with. And that's what we're going to teach here. Now, when we talk about the normal part of aging, this is some really interesting data. If you look at people um, here, men and women, as we get older, we void more. And, and Dave, I'm going to apologize because we don't have anything above 90 for you. Uh, so, <laughs> but, but as we get older, we void more. So again, it's a normal part of aging. What are we going to do about it? Do we have to live with it? That's the question we need to ask. And why is nocturia a problem? Well, it, nocturia wouldn't be a problem if, if magically our urine disappeared from our bladder at night. You know, if a little urine fairy came down, took it away, it wouldn't be a problem. But it's not, it doesn't happen that way. We get up when our bladder is full and we void. When we get up to void, we wake up. When we wake up, we get poor sleep. Restorative sleep happens within the first three to four hours. If we're disrupting that restorative sleep, then bad things happen. We're sleepy, right? So it affects sleep. Very simple. The consequences of nocturia, I mean, it's obvious. What, you know, we all went through med school. We all dealt with every other night call. We all dealt with the fact that we don't sleep very well and very long, and we relish the times that we have a chance to stay in bed. Most of the time, we can't sleep anyhow. All right, what happens? Well, you know, you, you're coming off call. You've slept an hour. You're sleepy. Your energy's not good. Your reaction's not good. You're, you're not focusing. My nurses will tell me I'm in a bad mood. Of course you're in a bad mood. You haven't slept. Those are the consequences in the long term. Depression, susceptibility to somatic disease, cardiovascular disease, risk of car accidents. I mean, not getting enough sleep is not a good evolutionary thing. So we need to find a way to fix that. In primary care, we talk a lot about osteoporosis. We talk about the fact that you should be shaking a bisphosphate so that when you fall, you bounce, you don't break. All right? Because we know that if you get an older patient who falls and breaks a long bone or a major joint, their mortality is very bad. It's 50% in a female for the first year. It's 70 to 80% for a male. So it's not good. It's a very grim prognosis. So obviously, the more often you get up, and somebody did a study on this, the more often you get up at night, the more often you fall. Well, that's kind of a no-brainer. So as opposed to just giving you medications to allow you to bounce and not break, maybe we should think about preventing you from falling, preventing that whole activity from when you fall. Now, this is, a, is what we call a spider graph. I'm sure you've seen it before. The global view of this slide is that nocturia ruins your life. All right. If you look at this, nocturia is bad. It affects all these quality of life. But I want you—I put this up only to focus on this one thing because what I deal with in my primary care setting, and especially being in Michigan, I deal with big, high BMIs. People are obese, and we try to work on why you're obese. What can we do to fix this? Well, guess what? If we don't sleep well, we eat. We're fidgety eaters. All right. And we've learned this. Everything is affected if sex you're sleeping, which is really interesting. So when I saw this slide, and I was totally working on it only for nocturia, I actually brought this back to my colleagues. In my, there are uh, quite a few of us in, in the office. And I brought it back to all of my partners. And I said, you know, maybe we should think about this differently. As we're talking to our obese patients about exercise and diet and portion control, let's find out how they're sleeping. Because are they actually eating because they're hungry? Or are they eating because they're fidgety eaters, which is something that we certainly see with Nocturia. So I thought that was an interesting side point. And this is my final point on that. It basically shows if you don't sleep well at night, your susceptibility to death is higher. Your survivability is bad. All right, so we know that. We know that. We know, from an, again, from an evolutionary standpoint, sleeping is good. We know that not sleeping is actually bad. So what are the risk factors for us? 
Well, we saw the slide that the older you are, the more often you get up. So age is a risk factor. There's also ethnic risk factors, med uh, 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 medical issues like diabetes, arthritis, asthma, hypertension, anxiety, depression, childhood bedwetting is a predictor. We've known about that. For men, it tends to focus on the prostate for reasons why, additional reasons you might have nocturia. For women, high body mass index, heart disease, inflammatory bowel issues, UTIs, or anatomic issues. So what have I learned as I've been working on this for quite some time? The, I, can't pin, I can't pin down the cause of nocturia because it, it, there's a lot of reasons, and it's a lot of combined reasons. I mean, we talk about the urologic being the BPH and the OAB. That's certainly a cause. It's also nephrologic. It's the kidney. It's hormones. It's sleep issues. It's cardiovascular issues. It's like my, you know, what happens to my wife, it's intake issues. So we have to pull all of this together as we're trying to figure out what to do. And as I've looked at this, I, I've, I, some parts have been made more simple and some parts have been made a little more complex. What I, I realized is that, we, first of all, we need to do what we all do in the office anyhow. We need to look at their evaluation to see, is there something causing this that I should know about? Are you a poorly controlled diabetic? Did you recently have surgery? Is there a medication causing this? Is your physical exam clear? If, you're, if I'm asking you to void, is the voiding apparatus normal? Is the outlet normal? All right, is your prostate okay? Do you have appropriate sphincter tone? Is neuro, everything neurologically okay? The voiding diaries, I think, are useful because it keeps an awareness issue. Like with my wife would look at a voiding diary and say, oh, my God, I'm drinking a gallon of water. And she would change that. But I don't think it's important for the volume issue because we're going to treat it regardless. The labs, certainly we want to check the urine for infection. We want to check the blood uh, for diabetes. You know, so there are th basic things that we want to keep an eye on. And that brings me back to a second part of this Elke, uh, Elke graph. How do we treat it? Well, we focus on the problem. And the first thing you should, you should learn from this under the treatment of nocturia for either decreased bladder capacity, increased fluid intake, or increased diuresis is this. Everything starts with behavior. We should be behavioralists first. If well, this may not solve the problem, I may not treat your heart completely with behavior, but if I can tr treat the with behavior something that's making it worse for you then I might be getting enough treatment that you're happy or I might be complimenting what I'm eventually going to give you so we want to start with behavior and we'll talk about that in a minute we then think about is it is it a capacity issue then we work on that that's the anti-muscarinics the Botox is a functional capacity well that's again your your bladder your BPH we've already talked about that the IC or treating whatever underlying disease if it's too much fluid, why? And is that too much fluid all the time? Or is it just at night? Change when you're taking your fluid. Again, take the water bottle away from the bed stand. Treat the diabetes. All right? Treat the alcoholism if they have that. You know, we, 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 I've seen patients come in with nighttime voiding. Their spouses bring them in, and it's because they're drinking a six-pack of beer before they go to bed. All right? Well, I better treat the alcoholism. I'm not going to treat your kidney issue because you don't have a kidney issue. What about the diuresis? If it's 24 hours now, we're probably talking a medical issue like di uh, the diabetes. Uh, maybe it's a kidney issue, a hormone issue. What if it's just at night? What if it's just at night? What if it's just that the fact that you have uh, poor heart function and you're swelling at night and you're mobilizing all that fluid? What if it's uh, you have cardiac insufficiency? What if it's sleep apnea? Or what if, what we're going to focus on in the rest of the talk, you're just not producing that signal to the kidney to slow down. Let's just slow down a little bit at night. Let's not create so much fluid so you have to get up. Uh, get up. And that's where you would have that AVP at those low levels. So if we start with behavioral interventions, because that's where that algorithm starts, that's simple stuff. I think we already all do this. And we, if, if we don't do it, we might have nurses who do it in the office. I know I, I, I have my nurses who focus on this. Decrease your intake. Limit your nighttime fluids. Empty your bladder. Learn how to empty. We've talked about bladder hygiene. S sit on the toilet. Count to 10, pee again. Stand at the toilet. Count to 10 and pee again. Make sure you're emptying everything. Reduce... Caffeine, alcohol, salt, uh, change. This is a common one. Change when you're taking your diuretic. And it's not just the nighttime diuretic. You may be taking it during the day. So I'll have a patient say, well, I'm getting up a lot at night. I started this hydrochlorothiazide. When do you take it? I take it at 6 p.m. I said, take it in the morning. 
I'll have some patients say, I take it in the morning. I pee at night. I said, take it at night. You know, each patient is going to react differently. So if there's something you can change, you want to change that. And we talk about compressive stockings or leg elevation or treatment of sleep apnea, barrier-free access to the toilet, weight loss exercise. All those things are very good. But, but then after behavior, our symptoms should drive us. So is, if you're getting up at night to void, is it you have a poor stream? I'm going to focus on the BPH. Maybe it is that urgency factor with OAB. I'm going to treat that. Maybe it's your sleep disorder. But the reality is 80% of those patients are here with nocturia due to nocturnal polyuria. And then we have to treat the cause. Now, this is the cause. And, and this is meant to be confusing because it's confusing to me. Is it an overconsumption issue, the behavior, the environment, the diabetes? Is it an overdiuresis issue? Or is it a too little antidiuresis issue? All right, so it gets complicated, and the reality is most of us aren't going to be able to exactly pinpoint that. But as I've worked in this for as long as I have, I've come to a recognition that we, the etiology might not matter as much as we think it does. Because regardless of the cause, nocturia is the production of nighttime urine that's greater than functional bladder capacity, all right? So why don't I just decrease the production? What is going to be harmed if I just decrease the function, just, just uh, decrease the, the creation of urine at night? Maybe we should think about that. Maybe we go back to the mechanisms of action here. We know that Arginine vasopressin is uh, produced in the hypothalamus, goes along the fibers to the posterior pituitary where it's stored, it's released, it goes to the collecting duct, it extracts free water. All right, this here, probably about 100, 150 mLs. All right, can we extract something like that from the kidney so that we don't produce that at night? So that our night, we reduce our nighttime production because what happens is the AVP pulls out the free water. That's the normal action. As we age, it's less, less potent. So there's this idea that, may, why can't we pause the kidney? Why can't we do this? Why can't we tell the kidney, let's, let's let you sleep. I'm going to hit a pause button right here. And that pause button is going to tell, I'm so sorry. Sorry about that. I left it in my pocket. Bad. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> So, yeah, I'm with the dog. So, why can't I pause that urine production? Why can't I put the, give the person, the patient Desmopressin, pause the kidney at night, tell the kidney, you know what, you're doing enough work during the day, slow down, let me pull some free water out so you don't produce as much urine. That's what we call pausing the kidney. That's a term we've just started using. So, we have... Desmopressin is available in different formulations. We have the nasal spray, the sublingual melt, we have the tablet. The tablet is not indicated for nocturia. It's certainly not direct for nocturia due to nocturnal polyuria. It is not indicated. It's not indicated because of safety reasons. For all the reasons that we didn't necessarily, we weren't necessarily fond of Desmopressin in the beginning because of some of the side effects, it is not indicated. But now in 2018, and this is the new stuff, we do have medications that are indicated. We have nasal spray and a sublingual melt that are indicated for nocturia due to nocturnal polyuria. So let's, for the next couple slides, let's explain how they are, let's explain how they work, and let's explain why they're safe, why it's safe to use in 2018. The nasal spray was studied in patients greater than or equal to 50, the sublingual melt in patients greater than 18. The nasal spray has two doses at 0.83 and 1.66 that are titratable. You have a T max of 15 minutes for the low dose, 45 for the, the uh, higher dose. For the sublingual melt, the, the, the uh, onset of action is 30 minutes, the avail um, and the available dose is 27 or tw uh, 55 for men. And these are gender specific. And this is an important differentiation. You have a titratable dose with the nasal spray. You start with a lower dose if you're 65 or older for safety reasons that I'll explain in a minute. It is gender specific for the sublingual melt and I'll explain why that is as well. So if we look at the efficacy of the medications, what we wanna do is look at a typical study design. We have patient characteristics as you see there. These are across all the studies. So I just wanted to show this as a typical design to point this out. These patients are really affected by their nocturia. They're avoiding 
th- more than three times a night. Nocturnal polyuria is present in 90% of them. It's not OAB, it's not BPH, it's something that's happening here and they're creating a lot of fluid. And a lot of these patients have OAB and BPH, which is to be expected. So let's start with this. If we're using a medication to stimulate arginine or mimic arginine vasopressin to pull free water out of the kidney, what's going to happen? We're going to decrease volume. So if any of these meds work, this is the first thing you want to see. Are you pulling fluid out of the kidney at night and how much are you doing it? So here's the sublingual dose. It's a lot of things we could learn from this slide. First of all, what you see is it's in titra- there's titration. You have 10, 25, 50, 100. What you see is it peaks for women at a different point for men. That's part of the reason why it's gender specific. Part of its efficacy, part of its safety. That's the first thing you learn. The second thing you learn is placebo works damn well. All right? Now, placebo is obviously not doing anything chemically to the kidney, but this shows behavior. This shows when a patient is in a study on lower urinary tract symptoms, they are paying attention to how they urinate and what they drink. So if you ever question the strength of behavioral therapy, look at the, beha- the placebo dose of any, of any uh, drug in any LUT study, and that will show you the strength of behavior. Now, let's think about the effect here. What you have is in the, the baseline here is about 800. So in here, they're voiding about 300 less. What does that mean? Well, if your bladder fills at 2 to 300, you are voiding 1 to 1 and a half times less because you're producing less urine. What does that do? Everything else will follow through. You're, you're producing less urine. When you look at the nasal desmopressin, the same thing. First of all, placebo works great, power of suggestion. But when you're looking at the higher dose, you're getting about 300 mLs less. It starts at 804 as a baseline, 300 less. You're voiding less. You're filling up less at night. You're voiding less. You're taking care of the fact that that overproduction of urine at night exceeds functional bladder capacity and everything else will follow through. So these things work. So this is really the only efficacy data I would ever need to see. But if you look at the papers, excuse me, you'll see the de- with the nasal desmopressin, the decrease in nocturnal voids, placebo works well, drug works better up to 1.5 for the higher dose, 1.5 decrease in nocturnal voids. You see the same for the sublingual desmopressin. You see the mean change in nocturnal voids goes down and the adjusted mean number of voids go down. So you, what you're seeing is a, an effect of what happens when you're introducing less urine to the bladder. And this shows it in women, and this shows it in men. Well, what about in the long term? In the long term, you want to make sure these work, because over time, does the body start to adjust? And what you see here is not only does a body not adjust in a 52-week trial in the sublingual, it stays the same for the women. It actually gets a little better for the men. So over time, it will continue to work, which is certainly beneficial. If you're producing less urine, what does that mean? You're going to take more time to fill up your bladder. If you take up more time to fill up your bladder, what does that mean? You sleep better. And this study shows that you get an addition of 108 minutes or 96 with a lower dose. That's a lot of time. An hour and 48 minutes, an hour and 36 minutes, this gives you more sleeping time, more opportunity to get to restorative sleep. You see the same for the sublingual desmopressin. You see an increase of 154 minutes, an increase of 111 minutes for men. More time to sleep, more opportunity to get to restorative sleep. What about in special populations? And this is entertaining to me because it shows what logic would tell us. If you have OAB and if you have BPH, it may be a mixed bag. You may just be creating too much fluid in addition to having a small bladder, in addition to having a large prostate. So these studies here show that when you add it with tamsulosin with a a male with BPH, it's going to improve them because you're giving them less urine production. And the same with tolteridine added to women. You're getting less urine production, which means their bladder is going to be emptying less. Now, it's important to look at the drugs for not only for efficacy, but for safety. And we look at them, we have comparable package inserts. With the sublingual desmopressin, what we see is, and here you see the drug names for the first and only time, they can cause hyponatremia. This is what we worry about. We worry about hyponatremia being bad. We worry about the fact that they could be taking medications that could exacerbate it, like the um, like loop diuretics or systemic or inhaled glucocorticoids. We talk about the fact that we have to watch it. 
if we talk about the fact that if you get it, you probably need to stop the medications. But let's talk about the hyponatremia a little bit because that's what we worry about. And something we've learned from the studies is that the, the higher the dose of the Desmopress and the less amount of time that the body gets a chance to equilibrate. So if you're using a low-dose Desmopressin, you're giving the body time to equilibrate, to fix itself. The kidney is a very smart organ. It'll equilibrate. And we're only pausing the kidney at night. So the time for urine production, this is with the sublingual, is about five hours for men and women. The time for the high urinalismality is about three hours. So we're giving the body the time to equilibrate. So if that's the case, do we get high, less hyponatremia? And that's what the studies have shown. In the, with the nasal desmopressin, this is the hyponatremia that we see at the 130 to 134 range, which we look at. We don't really make any changes. We watch. That's where the higher amount is, but it's not very high in and of itself. 126 to 129, I'm going to watch. I'm probably going to stop the drug. And less than 125, we certainly get concerned with. When we look at that, we see 0.3 for placebo and 1.5% five people in the lower, in the, um, for the higher dose. So let's come down on that a little bit. What we see is it doesn't happen to anybody below the age of 65. We see one with placebo. Again, I can't explain that. But you see them all with the patients in the higher dose. So that's 2.6% of the higher dose in the older population. So age is a risk, number one. Number two, four, four of the patients, four were male and four were on contraindicated drugs. So if we watch the drugs, beware of the contraindicated medications, we are going to be fine with that. We're just about to wrap up here. We've got the hyponatremia with the sublingual desmopressin. Let's look at the sodium less than 130 here. Now you see all the titration doses. And what you see is the higher the dose you go, the more risk you have. We've got the sweet spot at 50 for men for efficacy and safety, 25 for women. For the, less, the sodium less than 130, there are the 50 micrograms. Nobody less than the age of 65, 11% in the patients above 65, 2% in the women less than 65, and 4% in the women greater than, 60, uh, than 65. If we look at the sodium less than 125, which is our danger zone, you get nobody, no men under the age of 65, no women under the age of 65, no women over the age of 65, and 3% for men over the age of 65. So that's a low amount. It's equal it's, or it's, it's comparable to the uh, nasal spray. And what that teaches us is we still need to keep an eye on this, but it's a low percentage. If you look at it over the long term, you also see the safety. You see the higher numbers, 130 to 134, with the 126 to 129, you still have 4% and 10%. This is why we continue to watch, and only 1% less than 125. Again, this is why we continually watch the drug. So if we're going to be safe, because hyponatremia is what we are concerned about, we look at the risk factors, age, low serum sodium at baseline. You can read the rest there but we monitor the sodium. Now the FDA in the package insert said prior to initiation, seven days, 30 days, periodic thereafter. With all I've learned about in this, and as I've reviewed the studies, prior to initiation, seven days, 30 days, I agree with. I'm going to check it at 60 days, I'm going to check it at 90 days, and I'm going to check it every three months thereafter. Just like I do other electrolyte affecting medications in my practice. If they change medications, I want to know because I may need to keep a different eye on it. I may need to watch it more aggressively. aggressively. But if you do this, you're going to keep those patients safe. So as we wrap up here, what I've learned on Nocturia is it's just not the bladder, the prostate, or the urethra. All right, we have to worry about urine production. And this is where we, as primary care and urologists, need to work together. I need you all to treat the BPH, the OAB, when they're refractory, if I need help, if I need surgery. I, nocturia is an issue, too, because of nighttime production. And I'll take care of that. Let's work together on that. Pick up the phone call. Call me up. I'll monitor this. You guys worry about hyponatremia? I don't because I follow electrolytes. I do it all the time. Help me differentiate what's going on and communicate with me as, as a PCP. So my final slide for today, there is more to the urinary tract than the bladder, the prostate, and the urethra. We have to consider what's going through. That's very, very important. To treat LUTs, we evaluate storage flow and production. 
What I've learned now is that combination therapy using an antimuscarinic beta-3 is efficacious, safe, tolerated, and is now indicated and approved. And short-acting desmopressin is efficacious, safe in the treatment of nocturia. And it's a good option for us in 2018. Thank you.